Let me introduce, uh, say just a couple of words about who we are. I am, I am Anne Applebaum, and I'm the director of the Transitions Forum at the Legatum Institute. Uh, the Legatum Institute is a nonpartisan um, public policy institute in London, which um, is particularly interested in the question of prosperity, what is it, how do we get it, how do we create it. Um, and my piece of what the Legatum Institute does is to look at countries which are making radical changes, radical political changes, radical economic changes, and I've done a wide range of projects, um, countries in, you know, from Africa, North Africa, Europe, um, looking at the, at, the, um, at the process of transition and trying to come up with ways of thinking about it that, that are new. Um, the project that we're presenting today um, is really, a, you know, it sort of rep represents how we began thinking about some of these issues after doing it for two or three years. Um, and the more we work on um, countries in transition, the more we we realize the 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 that corruption and the question of corruption and how to fix corruption often lies at the center of whether or not you can even have a democracy. Um, so many, um, uh, so you know, so, so many young democracies are very quickly compromised, um, but because they're seen as corrupt or because they're they're unable to control corruption or fight corruption, um, that we've come to recognize it as a core. Um, you know, as, as, as a really core issue, you know, if you're not talking about corruption when you're talking about North Africa or you're talking about a democracy, then you're, you're missing one of the most important, um, one of the most important issues. Um, I'm glad Yerji referred to the Maidan. Um, anybody who watched the Maidan or went to the Maidan or followed the Maidan knows that at, at, you know, at its core, that was an anti-corruption demonstration. I mean, it was about joining Europe, but the people who wanted to join Europe wanted to do so because they perceived, correctly or incorrectly, that Europe would be a zone of, that would be less corrupt, that it would be a more fair and just, a, a more just part of the world to be part of. And that's a very, um, that's a very uh, fundamental motivation for people to want to be European um, in the in the eastern part of Europe, in the area of the Eastern Partnership, in the countries to the east of Europe. And it's very important that we understand that and include that as part of our as part of our policy toward the region. Um, we commissioned three papers, um, which we are we are, are available today. Um, which I all three of them they're each quite different, and I recommend all of them highly. We have two of the authors here. Oliver Bullock wrote a paper about Ukraine, which he's going to talk a little bit about, which begins with the explanation why the Orange Revolution failed, uh, what are the techniques of corruption in Ukraine, and in particular how the West fa helps facilitate corruption in Ukraine. Um, the author of our Moldova paper could not be here, uh, Vladimir Solovyev. Um, he is the former editor of Commerçant Moldova. And this, I think, is almost the most relevant to European audience, because he talks very specifically about how these are the pro-EU, pro pro-European parties in Moldova have become tainted by reputation of corruption and, and how that's bad for both for democracy and for the integration of Moldova. Um, the third paper was done a little bit differently. The author is Peter Pomerantsev and it was done with a, a group of other people. I was one of the, co not really co-authors, but co, I was part of the team that helped write it, as was Jeffrey Robertson, who's a very well-known human rights lawyer, and Jovan Ratkovic, who's a Serbian, um, Serbian reporter, uh, uh, so, sorry, Serbian reformer. Um, and this paper looks at, we looked specifically at police and judicial reform in Georgia, which also it fundamentally were about, were, were anti-corruption measure, and looked at how the reform worked and what were the tactics and how it succeeded and failed. So we don't have Vladimir, but we have Peter and Oliver. Um, for those of you who don't know, these are two extremely distinguished, both very, so widely published, I can't even list the numbers of places where their writing appears. They both write um, not only about Russia, not only about the former Soviet space, but, but both very largely um, focused on, they've both written multiple books. Peter's has just been, new one has just been released. Um, the title is, uh, nothing is true and everything is possible. Nothing is true and everything is possible. It's a book about Russia. And Oliver's latest book is... The Last Man in Russia. The Last Man in Russia, which was um, published last year. Right. Anyway, so I, I will begin. We're going to conduct this not as a presentation of reports. You can all read the reports. You can either get the physical copy or they're, of course, available on the Legatum Institute website, li.com. Um, and, but we're going to conduct this as a sort of panel discussion in which I will try and bring out some of the themes of the three reports. And then, of course, we'll include some of you um, later on in a, in, a broader, in a broader conversation. Um, I think we decided we would start with Oliver, um, who, who, as I said, his paper focused on what, what exactly, when we talk generally about corruption in Ukraine, 
um, you know, um, what's specific about it? What, you know, what, how, how does it, um, what's the nature of it? Um, what's the structure of it? And how is, the, how is it that in your, one of your central arguments is that Western banks and Western governments have facilitated it, and that's part of the reason why it exists. Can you explain a little bit, give us an outline of, the, of that argument? Yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, this, this paper was published in July last year, and so it does begin with a lengthy section on why the Orange Revolution failed. That was in 2004, Ukraine's last revolution. To be honest, it, it could, if I were to write it now, it could easily be prefaced with why this revolution is failing. I think this revolution is failing essentially for the same reasons that one failed. And I'm going to try and explain a little bit about what corruption in Ukraine means. So sort of conceptually, it's quite important not to think of the government in Ukraine as a government in the way which most people understand it. It is essentially a machine that has been created and was essentially perfected by Viktor Yanukovych to steal as much as it can from the people of Ukraine. Um, it, it did this so successfully and so enthusiastically that it essentially collapsed under the weight of its own extraordinary greed. Anyone who has the chance to go to Kiev um, can go and see Yanukovych's palace. Um, we have um, two sets at Kiev. One of them, Mezhuhiria, is open to anyone who wants to go and can pay the entry fee to the man on the, on the door. Um, you can wander around and see the sheer vulgarity of this man's greed. It was absolutely extraordinary. And the more I, time I spend talking to his associates, to his uh, rivals, to people who are just involved in the machine, the more you realize how deeply enmeshed this machine of theft was in the Ukrainian state to such an extent that it essentially was the Ukrainian state. Um, this causes massive problems for anyone trying to change, to create a, um, an honest state administration. The judiciary is essentially corrupt, totally corrupt. Uh, the prosecutors who have great powers are, are totally corrupt and therefore essentially designed to execute a, a function that is very different to the one that they are um, actually executing. I have a friend, Anna, um, a journalist. She um, produced a report the other day about a businessman funding the separatists in eastern Ukraine. Um, she went to show it to the prosecutors to try and persuade them to take action against, against this. After an hour's presentation in which she repeatedly talked about films on YouTube that showed this as evidence, his first question was, what's YouTube? And this is the level of ignorance of basic investigative practice among ordinary Ukrainian prosecutors. This is a real problem. Um, as you, you may have heard, uh, last week, Ukrainian finally issued an in, uh, asked for an Interpol red notice to be issued against the former president, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, that took them almost a year to issue an arrest warrant for the fled president. There have been no prosecutions. There are essentially no ongoing investigations into all these people who, who stole the country. Um, and this, this is because the state machinery is essentially broken. Um, now, this is not, however, just a Ukraine story. There is what, what in, um, a couple of my friends and I refer to as supply-side and demand-side corruption. Um, the point being that you don't steal money, you steal things, if you don't have some way of keeping them. Um, if you steal property in Ukraine um, by abusing uh, the courts to steal someone else's company, to steal someone else's money, then you are essentially as vulnerable as that person was to have that money stolen again in another way if you don't manage to get it somewhere else, if you don't get it outside Ukraine. It is therefore of, of great significance to the oligarchs who have come to dominate Ukrainian politics and um, economy that any money that they make, any assets that they make, can be spirited out of Ukraine and kept as, as, as far away and as safe as possible. Um, and the West, and this I think is crucial if we are able to do, if we are to do anything to assist Ukraine in managing to clear up its, this terrible mess that they found themselves in. Um, the, the West has, has put itself at the disposal of the Ukrainian oligarchs um, openly and um, knowingly in order to allow them to launder and keep their assets. There are certain countries that are more guilty than others. Cyprus um, is very deeply implicated. Latvia, Austria, very deeply implicated. And of course, um, the, the big one is, of course, London. Um, Mezhuhiria, the palace that I hope you visit if you go to Kiev, was owned via a London holding company. Um, uh, Sukhulutia, his hunting lodge also outside Kiev, was owned by another London holding company. These were being kept in plain sight in London. Uh, another, another oligarch I'm currently investigating, he was a very close friend of, of Yanukovych's and who um, is on the EU uh, sanctions blacklist, 
All of his companies operate freely to this day out of London, despite the fact that all his assets are supposedly frozen. Um, if the Western, particularly London, but also the, the, the other EU countries were not providing these services to former to oligarchs from the former Soviet Union, they would not steal as much as they, as they do, and the fact that they would not be able to keep as much as, as much as they are keeping. So I think it's very important that we recognize that we are an equal part of the problem. Um, we, are, we are essentially fencing the goods that are stolen. Um, and so um, if, in, in my paper, I, I write a few things that I, I think should be done, I think the most important thing that we could do would be to enforce our own anti-money laundering laws on this money. Um, the banks, to be honest, aren't doing a bad job. Uh, the banks are doing okay. But there are massive problems in company formation agents, particularly in London. Um, there are massive problems with the state agents, particularly in Latvia and Malta. Um, all of these things are very easy to be done. They could be done very quickly, and that would be the way that we could help the Ukrainians most. Essentially, the money that has been stolen is gone. Um, it will not be coming back again. There was one case in the 1990s of um, uh, Lazarenko, a prime minister who stole extensively and was jailed in the United States for it. Despite the fact that this case has been going on since the late 1990s, his money has still not been returned to Ukraine. The money that was stolen is gone, it will not come back. What is important is to prevent more money being stolen. And the way to do that is for the EU to enforce its own laws and to prevent being quite so enthusiastic about accepting stolen money. Thank you very much. And perhaps pushing this kind of subject higher up the EU agenda. Oh, uh, yes. If, I mean, if the EU is serious about you know, creating a possibility for change in Ukraine. I mean, there are essential problems, which is there are so many EU states who are so prepared to so enthusiastically compete with each other to receive this money. Um, if, you, if you just have to look at which, which states provide uh, leave to remain in exchange for a particular size investment in real estate in those countries, and Latvia is obviously very close to the top of this list, that, that is a, an extraordinarily, essentially corrupt process. This gives someone with almost no questions asked money the right to do what they like within the Schengen zone. Um, these, these, need to be, these kind of schemes need to be exposed for what they are, um, rather than just accepted as part of the way we do business. This should not be the way we do business. Um, thank you, Oliver. Um, I'll turn to Peter, who has a, has a slightly different story to tell when we, um, uh, you know, in Georgia, it's the opposite story. So in Georgia, there was, under the beginning with, with the Saakashvili government, there was an attempt to control and fight corruption, which um, succeeded in some ways and didn't succeed in others. Um, but it's, and, and it's, Georgia is, of course, very relevant, and it's very often spoken about as a model for Ukraine. And some of the, some of the Georgian reformers have been in Ukraine or in Ukraine frequently. And there's a, there's, a, there's a lively conversation about whether there are lessons learned from Georgia for Ukraine. Um, so maybe, and, and, and I should say, and for other countries in the region and around the world. I mean, I'm aware of um, lots of people coming to study the Georgian reforms. Uh, Peter, could you explain that what was the, you know, well, the thing I, 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 I liked about the way the paper was written is that the, ti the title is Revolutionary Tactics. In other words, what was the strategy to fight corruption? What was the, what was the tactic? Um, that that uh, that Saakashvili used and his government used at the time, and then later we can talk about the role the EU played. But, but. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll open with a, with, with a quote from um, a man who died recently, um, who was one of the sort of uh, uh, the gurus of the Georgian reform process. And I don't know how many of you met Kaka Ben He used to come around. So he was a fantastic personality and uh, maybe the the ideal interview subject. But this was a. A quote he told me uh, when he was trying to sum up his idea of uh, how you should approach reforms. I won't do a silly accent. Soviet instruction leaflets for Kalashnikovs described it as an implement to shoot, hit or stab with. The same with reforms. Use any method you can. If you can't shoot, stab. There is no McKinsey guide to reforms. Theories are meaningless. My main advice, don't write a plan. Write aims. You might write down 20 aims and if you achieve one of them, that's great already. If there are institutions which abuse the system, then just get rid of them. But remember, reform has to be sold for different audiences. Take privatisation. It has to be sold to some as an intellectual ideal, to others as a way to fight corruption, and to others as a way to make money. I think, you know, it's a fantastic quote anyway, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's very interesting because it already sort of uh, includes this theme of you have to sort of uh, sell the idea of reform uh, even before you start selling reform. So when they... Uh, the young sort of rose revolutionaries came to power in, in Georgia in 2004-ish, in, in um, uh, they were faced with a, a state uh, 
as troublingly uh, corrupt as, as Ukraine and also with a very strong criminal element, which was in turn connected to Moscow, which had almost affected state capture. And, you know, they, they, they'd come into power on the promise of reform, but this was nothing new in Georgia. I mean, uh, the previous uh, governments under Shevardnadze would also often talk about the need for reform and the IMF would give this money, it would disappear, and there was this sort of this tiredness of talking about reforms. And, and the first sort of few months, they really didn't know what to do because they'd you know, arrived on this promise. They had no idea how to fulfill it. And it was very interesting talking to them. What they kind of realized is they, what they need is like a pilot reform, one reform to prove to everybody that you could actually reform the country. It's almost, the effect was much more about psychology and I, don't, I use this in a positive way, about marketing. Um, they were selling the idea of reform and they thought, what could we reform first? Uh, and so they looked at um, um, customs. Customs was a real problem. Uh, they thought, great, we'll reform the customs service. But the minute they tried to move on to the bureaucracy there, they got massive pushback. I mean, basically, the customs would just wouldn't let anything through the border. Uh, and they were basically being held hostage by their own bureaucracy, but they didn't feel strong enough to break them yet. And so after looking at different sexes, um, they lighted on something which was really quite small and, in a way, you know, in terms of the infrastructure of corruption, quite meaningless, uh, which was, which then became a very famous successful uh, story, the, the traffic police. And, and they chose the traffic police because everyone hated them. They were demoralized. Uh, there was dirt on all of them because they were all so corrupt and taking bribes. Um, and they were kind of small. They could do it. They chose something they could do. Um, and, and their approach was very radical. They, they sacked them all overnight. Uh, for several months, Georgia had no traffic police, to no detriment in the traffic. Quite an interesting experiment to do. If we were to get rid of the Belgian traffic police, would actually traffic improve? I don't know. Um, uh, there was no detriment to the traffic, because all these guys were doing was standing on corners and taking bribes. If anything, they were making it worse. And they launched on an incredibly, uh, 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 you know, complete process, but also very, very um, uh, focused on consensus building in society. So in order to hire the new traffic police, they almost created like a reality show. Uh, they, they sort of, the, the process was televised as they selected new candidates. Celebrities were involved to sort of pick the new candidates. And, and, and it was also a beauty contest. Before that, uh, there was a very uh, uh, a visual stereotype of a traffic cop. It was somebody fat, overweight, asking for a bribe. Uh, so suddenly, and male. Suddenly they went for young people uh, who had to speak English. Something like 30% of them were female. So it was, it was a casting. Um, and they managed to build up this consensus. They gave them new guns, new uniforms, new cars. I mean, the guns were full of symbolism. They went from Russian guns to Israeli-American guns. The whole thing was like a, a, a very conscious visual shift from, from sort of Soviet corruption uh, um, sort of world uh, picture. And, uh, and it was an amazing success. Uh, once they'd done that, they then had the courage to go further and reform the police. I mean, when this started, everybody in the police was like, yeah, yeah, reform them, you'll never touch us. But they had so much public backing, they could start breaking the police. And in the end, they managed to break customs. That was the positive side. We could get, get into what failed in their reform process and the dark side of the reform process, which was actually systemically embedded in their fight against corruption. Uh, because in order to fight corruption, the, what you have to get under control of the courts, because all the courts were you know, bought by, were corrupted, uh, but that brought the courts under such vicious control of government that uh, they became sort of hanging courts, basically. So that's one of the paradoxes of, um, of, of, of trying to root out corruption. You end up creating a, a security service apparatus, which is, which is uh, very quickly becomes uh, a law unto itself. So, um, but it was amazing talking to the world extent. They, they were very aware of this idea that you have to prove to the public that you can do reforms. And you can start with a small reform before you do the big reforms. Um, could, you know, one of the interesting things when we went to Georgia was, um, you know, the, the Georgians still talk about the, both the EU association agreement and the accession to NATO um, as major motivators. You know, we want to do reforms in order to be in NATO, in order to be in the EU, in order to have an association agreement with the EU. Um, I think when we were there, we we began to question the logic of that and whether that was really working, um, both because. You know, the, the, you know, first of all, there's a question whether Georgia will be, and if Georgia in either the EU or NATO, and if, if it's not going to be, does that mean they give up on reform? Is that the only motivation? Um, what did you think um, about, about the role, the, 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 how, the, how the Georgians saw the EU association agreement, and was that a good motive or a bad motive for reform? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's complex. Um, homosexual sex, which might seem ridiculous to us, but actually, you know, th th this has gained traction inside of Georgia, it's gained traction inside Moldova, gained traction in huge parts of, of Ukraine. Um, uh, uh, secondly, there's a broader attempt by Russia to undermine the very idea of transition. I mean, there's a very strong story that they're pushing, and it has a very welcome audience in, in parts of Central Europe as well, that um, uh, transition was a disaster, that well, it gets summed up always with one phrase. Do you want to be like Bulgaria? Um, you, do you really want to enter the EU? You will end up like Bulgaria. Uh, or, and they keep on sort of raising, questioning the very sort of idea of what happened in Central Europe after, after, 90, after 91. So um, th there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, narrative complexities tied up with, with the EU, which if you start looking at them, uh, that's quite a dangerous territory. Um, indeed. <clears throat> Do you want to talk a little bit about EU narratives and Russian narratives in Ukraine and how that plays into your subject? Uh, essentially, the, um, the Ukraine, as everyone knows, is fighting a war in the east. Um, I, I, I think, and, and certainly the way that I visualize what's happening in, in the east of Ukraine, is it's essentially the same war that is being fought against corruption as being fought in the east of Ukraine. And the reason for this is that for Russia, um, this is an existential threat. If Ukraine becomes as it were, Poland, um, if Ukraine is, begins to enforce the rule of law, is enforce the, uh, the same of the, the rights of the market to everyone, um, then Russian companies cannot hope to compete, essentially. Um, yeah, American companies, European companies, Japanese companies will do everything Russian companies do better and cheaper. So this is one of the reasons why Putin is so desperate to hold on to Ukraine. It is very important to him that um, corruption, which is something that his companies do better than our companies, um, r r continues to be the rules of the game. He has, however, managed to very successfully spin this, and thanks to his, his control of RT and, and I think his, his, his influence over, over other sort of commentators in the Western press, he's managed to very successfully spin this, essentially a battle over money. Who gets the money? Um, is it Western companies or Putin's friends? Um, he's managed to spin this as, as a war of ideas. Um, there is this, this um, gay roper which is how, how uh, many Putin supporters in, in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea refer to Europe. This, this idea that, and it does sound ridiculous, the enforced homosexuality, particularly enforced homosexuality on children, is something that has somehow peculiarly managed to gain major traction among um, people who oppose the revolution in Kiev but don't really know why they oppose it. Um, it is... You know, there are many reasons to oppose the revolution in Kiev. Uh, the idea that essentially one group of oligarchs has been replaced by another group of oligarchs is, is essentially objectionable. But that, this is something that is it's difficult to make that into a coherent argument, because if you object to oligarchs, then why didn't you object to the previous one of oligarchs? However, if you can claim that this is about the imposition of an alien set of values on an essentially unwilling country, then you gain a, a, a logic to, to, a, to an essentially mercenary argument that was not otherwise there. And I think we do have to recognise that the Russian media has run rings around, um, particularly the Ukrainian media, but also to a large extent the Western media, in managing to push this narrative and essentially lie. They've lied very successfully and, and repeatedly. And, and I mean, as we saw around the, the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, um, MH17, there is a very clever tactic of skipping from lie to lie to lie. As soon as a lie is exposed, even before a lie is exposed, another lie is already being told, because it takes a lot more effort to expose a lie than it takes to tell a lie. And I think it is, it is something that the, that the EU and European countries as a whole need to get much better at, is, is, is pushing back at this, coming up with ways of, of presenting a positive narrative of what the EU means. Because if you... If, if, if you point out that you know rights for human rights for everyone does not mean children are being forced to be homosexual. You know, that is that is a very easy argument to make. It's not an argument being made. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, certainly in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea, um, the EU is losing the, the war in people's minds um, if it isn't necessarily losing yet the war on the ground. Yes, I would argue that's happening in the Balkans and even to some extent in Central Europe um, as well. Yeah, and I, and to be honest, it may well be happening in, in, in the Baltics too. I mean, this is, you know, the, the Russian language media space is something that has been essentially abandoned um, by Europeans. Uh, the BBC Russian radio, which admittedly was a sort of a shadow of what it used to be, is, 
was it pretty much it's pretty much entirely gone as a radio service. It now exists as a website. Um, you know, there was no one else attempting to take the this 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 war of ideas to to the Russian TV stations. And Peter knows this much better than me because he used to you know work with some of these people. But but um, the Russian TV stations have managed to combine you know their Western informed Russian content in the most remarkable way. The, 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 the brashness and the slickness of the best Western reality shows um, combined with a, a degree of, of cynical um, falsehood, which is, is astonishing, really. It, every time I watch it, I find my, myself astonished by it. Yes, I would actually argue that uh, Putin has, an, there's another motivation for his desire to undermine Ukraine, which is the, the, which is actually a real battle of ideas, which is that a Ukraine, which if we can imagine it, which was um, relatively prosperous and relatively successful and relatively democratic, and relatively well integrated into the West, poses a huge ideological um, problem for Russia. You know, so if if Ukraine, because Russia and Ukraine, they are culturally and they are linguistically similar. If you if it's possible for Ukraine to be a Western country, why can't Russia be a Western country? And there are many Russians who and 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 the, you know Putin is making an argument, you know, which he's been making for ten years. That, that Russia can't be Western, it's different. But if Ukraine can be, then that undermines his argument. I think it's part of the story. Essentially, the freest sort of Russian language media space in, in, in the world is in Kiev. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem that, that Putin did not face really with Georgia, due to the fact that, that hardly anyone outside Georgia speaks Georgian. Um, there is an enormous amount of material being produced in Kiev in Russian. Um, they, they, they spend time on the same social networks talking the same language. And this is, this is a major... Um, it is. It's, it is a major threat to, to Putin that the, the ideas are coming into his space that, that he's struggling to control, which is why he's fighting back so hard with the, with the full armory of the state media and, and actually doing it very well. Yeah, actually, maybe, Peter, if you, we can talk a little bit about um, our, our author isn't here, but a little, Moldova makes a very interesting um, case study in this regard, both as, an, as a story of how, uh, how corruption works, and part of the paper is about that, um, but also as a story about how EU policy in Moldova has in some ways succeeded and in some ways failed and may be being undermined by corruption and specifically by corruption which is coming from Russia as well as a Russian narrative. Why don't you, you can explain it better than I, I think. Um, I think, yeah, I, it's, um, yeah, this is the third sort of threat to the, 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 the idea of the EU that, that one comes across and it was in, sort of latent in Georgia but very, very strong. Uh, very strongly brought out in the Moldova paper. I don't claim to be a Moldova expert. I will just sort of, you know, tr try to pick on some of the ideas that Vladimir brought out so brilliantly. It's, it's a stunning paper. Um, uh, put very, I think one statistic brings it out. So when the uh, former Communist Party was, was in charge in Moldova, in the mid-2000s, um, the um, approval rating for joining the EU among the population, something like 60... Or the EU Association. Right? Yeah, to, to, well, to be pro-EU and move towards the EU, and, and, and I think there's a whole bunch of issues, was something like 60%. Once the pro-EU parties got into power and proved themselves to be horribly corrupt and full of the most terrible infighting, um, now the approval rating uh, for being sort of vectoring towards the EU is only 40%, it's 44%, while pro-Moscow is 40%. So now that the pro-EU parties are in power and are reviled, uh, the society seems to be split between should we be closer uh, to Moscow or should we be closer to, to Brussels. Um, so this is a, a real structural problem because the EU becomes associated with a certain clique uh, then, when that clique turns out to be terrible, uh, it's the you know the overall EU um, um, uh, sort of like uh, desire to be part of the EU that, that, that gets undermined. Something similar happened in Georgia. Though it wasn't the, the statistics aren't quite so frightening, but because the EU in people's minds became so closely associated with the Saakashvili government. Uh, when, um, uh, when, when there was a sort of a, a turning against that government, it sort of it hurt the uh, reputation of not just the EU, the EU World Bank, the US, or altogether the West. Uh, so this is another problem. But again, we keep on having the same issue that for the EU not to be kidnapped in other people's narratives, it has to have its own, um, you know, uh, strategic voice. Uh, which, which it doesn't have. The EU is very proud of being this great soft power uh, operator. It's sort of true. I mean, people were prepared to die for the EU in Kiev. I don't think that was a plan by Brussels. Um, but uh, 
uh, actually where they use rubbish at it and it's being made into mincemeat and it really, whether that's something as crass as a voice of the EU that needs to be created or just a much more refined uh, uh, tools of, of strategic communication. At the moment, the EU is just like this, you know, this, this, this sort of toy that gets dragged into other people's narratives uh, in all sorts of very unhealthy ways. Right, so on the one hand, um, and some kind of real EU information policy, on the other hand, a real EU fight against corruption mm. in, in our own countries, you know, would be, you know, would be two things that we could do to help spread peace and prosperity into the regions to the east of the EU. I think, I think it would be, if there was a genuine EU effort to crack down on the, on, the, on the dirty money coming into the EU, it would make an astonishing amount of difference. It would essentially break the Putin-ite, the, the, the Putin business model, the Putin model. I mean, the, the model that Yanukovych created in Ukraine was essentially the Putin model. It just wasn't so successful because without oil and gas, you can't steal that much um, because everything begins to fall apart. Um, it is a model that is based on essentially quite aggressive nationalism at home. Um, uh, so for the 99% of the population, aggressive nationalism and pride in your country. For the 1% at the top, it is total carte blanche to steal as much as you want and to take it and send your, send your children to school in England and to university in, in, in America um, and to skiing holidays in Switzerland. These, you know, that is the, the Putin model. And to deny the chance to, to get the money out, to deny the chance to send your school to children in England and University of America and so on, you essentially break the model, it no longer works. Um, and that is, I think, something that the, the, the EU countries need to get much better at, isolating the money that shouldn't be allowed in. And it is obviously a difficult argument to sell at the moment in the EU. Money is something everyone is particularly attached to, um, and, and it's tough. But I, but I think that it's important to recognise that this is a national security issue, um, because um, the, the more money we accept from these people, in fact, peculiarly, the stronger we are making them, um, and the stronger they are, the more of a challenge they can... Um, opposed to our values in places like and, Ukraine. And our political institutions. And our, and our political institutions. Not, not just in Ukraine, but not also just here. To, yeah, yeah. Not just talking about the funding of, of political parties in, in France um, and in other parts, and in, in Hungary and other parts of the EU, but, 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 but um, you know, able to use these sort of perverted media techniques to undermine um, the sovereignty of, of all the countries with Russian-speaking minorities. Obviously, we're talking about the Baltic states. Specific, particularly, but obviously, and, and then Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and all the peripheral countries which you know the EU would like to have good, stable, neighbourly relations with. It is a, it is a, it is important to recognise that this business model isn't just harmful to the countries where the money is being stolen from. It is also actively harmful to us. Right. On that cheerful note, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would anybody like to make a comment or ask a question? I know this is a very distinguished audience. If you could introduce yourselves, because we're we're normally based in London, so we don't know all of you. So if you could, if you could. Um, my name is uh, Bogdana Debo. I'm uh, advisor to MEP and also vice president of the Global Youth Anti-Corruption Network. So we have two two a little bit more than two thousand NGOs around the world. Ukrainian. No. I'm Ukrainian, yes. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to say. <laughs> yes, I'm Ukrainian. I would like to ask um, a colleague who actually made a presentation on Moldova but spoke a lot on Georgia. Um, what, one, what a little bit uh, worries me is that a few years ago, let's say, Georgia was an example, you know, globally. And if you go to the South Caucasus, everybody would, you know, like taxi drivers, they would say, look at Georgians, how successful they are, you know, in Azerbaijan, in Armenia and in Georgia, obviously. If you look now at the situation in Georgia, you have about 150 uh, politicians, you know, imprisoned or uh, being persecuted in one or another way. You see amazing deterioration of the human rights, um, you know, democracy, basically. What, and you spoke about selling the reform process. So my question is like how, maybe you have reflected on this, how politicians could have sold the reform in the way to make this transition sustainable. You know, to make sure that today we would have, Georgia would have, the police system that is not right, courts which are not right, etc. Why is it gone? What could they have done differently? <coughs> this is very, you know, important for Ukraine as well as, you know, globally. Uh, and uh, also uh, the question is more related to Ukraine. Uh, I fully agree with you that there is no, there is little political will, there is huge lack of knowledge uh, in Ukraine on how to tackle corruption. And it came to the absurd that simply NGOs uh, prepare the documents 
bring it to the state prosecutor, and state prosecutor passes the documents, and then the official prosecutors, you know, work on them and investigate. But there is a problem on the EU side, as you have mentioned. At the national level, um, if, simply because there is a profit out of the corruption, but also because it's politically unfeasible or inconvenient to accuse your own state that you are leading of the corruption that some people are covering. So are you aware, aware of any, let's say, successful campaigns led by NGOs or states that were able to address the issue and to make sure you know, to, that the issue would be addressed at the EU level? Because, for example, if, if anybody at the EU level or national level is approached, then, and if you are Ukrainian, then immediately you get a reply, look what is happening. You know, it's your own problem. Solve the issue first. You know, you is not a biggest challenge in here. Thank you. Um, do you, do you want to go first, or Peter? Right. Okay, go ahead. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, when the one institution that works in Ukraine are the NGOs. There are some astonishingly good NGOs um, who have been doing some invaluable research into corruption. But frankly, at significant risk of their own lives, um, uh, and have and have got results. The results they have got may look small. Um, Often they, they're forcing businessmen to every year use new shell companies to, to run the corrupt tender process. But that is a major result for Ukraine. This, this is, um, they, they are astonishing. And if anyone in this room has a budget and wants to do something to help Ukraine, give these guys money. I'm happy to give you a list afterwards. Just, just let them <laughs> open an office in every Ukrainian city and continue doing what they're doing because they are incredibly good. Um, in terms of what's happening within the EU, um, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think there has been any... Um, in any EU country, I do not think there's been a recognition of the role we play in undermining our neighbours um, by, by not enforcing our own laws. Um, there, have been, there are, however, a few positive steps. Um, well, well, I can think of one, um, which is <coughs> the UK is going to start publishing beneficial ownership of shell companies, um, which is you know, a, a major step. Uh, sadly, it's not a step that applies to all the UK-owned tax havens, um, so it doesn't actually really mean anything. But it's a start, um, and we have come a long way in 20 years. But, but, um, but no, I mean, I think if anyone, if anyone, if ever you approach anyone in the EU and they tell you, you know, it's Ukraine's job to deal with this, then, then it's important to push back and say that's not true. Um, the EU is at least as culpable, or EU countries are at least as culpable in this as Ukraine. And, you know, it also has a, that, and that problem, both in Ukraine actually and in Russia and in, in other countries in the region, um, the fact of sort of, you know, and there, there the, the role of the West is also perceived as collaborative. In other words, um, and this is particularly true, you know, the, the, the Russian opposition, um, you know, small though it is, um, has great objections to the West and doesn't see the West anymore as a model, precisely because they say, well, look, you're collaborating with our government all the time, you know, so why should we... You know, why should we model ourselves on you? What does your system have to offer us as a model or as a or as a, as a help? You know, they've, we you know we we are very much at risk by not reforming our own institutions. We're very much at risk of compromising our own reputation and our own um, our own ability to be influential. You know, and, and our ability to advise or I mean, let alone to serve as a model, but to serve as a, as an inspiration even for these other countries. Um, if we are seen as the facilitators of Russian or Ukrainian corruption, then why should anybody pay any attention to anything we say? You know, it's all, you know, it's, and, and this is, of course, there's a, uh, and this is a line which is used by the Russian state, you know, qu quite openly. You know, we're, okay, we have oligarchs, you have oligarchs. We have corruption, you have corruption. I mean, it's a very, very cynical, um, often repeated um, description of the West, which sees it as a kind of mirror reflection of Russia, only more hypocritical. Um, and I think it's very important that we find ways, both in terms of controlling corruption, but also in terms of, of you know, an, um, an information campaign of fighting back against that. Um, did you want to answer the question about Georgia? Which is yeah, how, how does one make reform sustainable? I think that's a, we try to address some of those issues in the paper. These aren't really my answers. The paper was really collecting various um, clever people. So in terms of courts, uh, Jeffrey Robertson, who was with us, um, suggested, uh, he's talking about corruption, how do you make a sort of, he sort of wanted to create a supra court that deals just with corruption, which is nominated permanently, so there's no political influence on judges, and which might be partly internationalized. And he gave us a model ICAC, 
the Independent Commission Against Corruption, which works in Hong Kong and Australia. So you might want to look at that. But he, he was, yeah, he said we, you almost have to, so that corruption doesn't become political football, uh, you always have to create a separate judicial body which just deals with that. More, more, more sort of practically, um, one of the great sort of kind of sort of sad consequences of creation of a healthy opposition, or the destruction of a healthy opposition, is is has very bad consequences, and and so I think that's very important to let an opposition foster. Um, but there's another one which is sort of the sort of I don't know the super objective. I mean, the reason at the end of the day that, that, that reforms plus minus worked in Eastern Europe because they did have EU entry as sort of the super narrative they could always come back to. So it didn't matter who was in power. They were still kind of stuck in this system that got them somewhere. And Serbia were going through a very big wobble. But at the end of the day, I think there's an overall sense that you know, Serbia will get there because it almost has to like, you know, like convert it to Judaism. It has to fulfill all these laws which will get them to the other side. Um, that's a bit of a spurious metaphor, but still. Um, uh, but um, uh, what worries me about Moldova and Georgia and Ukraine, they don't have that. So when they go off the rails, they'll completely go off the rails because there's nowhere for them to head to. Um, but um, you can make your own logical conclusions from, from that concept. Yeah, I would, I would say two things. When we, were, when we were in Georgia, we had this, we met with many of the people who'd been leading reformers during Saakashvili's government. Um, and we asked them exactly this question, you know, what could you have done differently? Um, and they did mention, you know, we should have allowed, we, you know, we were too harsh on the, on the emerging opposition. We, you know, that was one thing they mentioned. Um, uh, they also spoke a lot about education. You know, one of the things we didn't tackle was education. We didn't work on schools. We didn't create universities. We didn't, because they were in power for how many years? For Ten, ten, nine. nine years. So that you know, so they had you know there was there was time to have done more work on that and to to have thought more deeply about it. Um, and they also spoke about the courts. Um, they they knew that. I mean, they didn't. They were sort of careful about how they said that. But I think they, you know, they having f the the failure to create an, a truly independent judiciary, which may have, you know is a very difficult thing to do in any country. Uh, the failure to create a truly independent judiciary meant that once they were gone, there, you know, the there was still a politicized judiciary in place, um, which could do some of the things you're talking about. You know, put politicians in jail, um, act like a um, act like a, a political wing of the government rather than an independent judiciary. So this was their, one of their failures was to was to try to establish that. And of course, their motivation at the time was, you know, we need the judiciary to fight criminals, and so we're not going to. We're not going to. We're not going to give it true independence from the government. I mean, they didn't. I don't think they would put it quite that way. But I think. I think that's. Okay. I think that's. Um, that's what happened. I mean, there is a. There, there are sadly issues with unintended consequences here. Um, Ukraine in two thousand and one, during one of their spasms of reform, which were tended to be very short, and it did create an independent judiciary, which was one of the most disastrous things that it did in the post-Soviet reforms. Um, having had judiciary that was politically motivated, but you know what, you could get a decision if it wasn't a political case. Um, they went um, independent and judges had absolutely no restraint on them at all and became immediately for hire. I, had, I have a friend who's a lawyer who went away and studied for a year in the States, having worked in the 90s. He then went away for a year, came back after this form had been implemented and his job had changed completely from being a lawyer to being essentially a man who collected bags full of banknotes from his clients, took them to the judge's clerk and then got the then got the clerk to sign off on them and that was it. And then you just had to hope that you'd given more money than your opponent. If you had, you won. If you hadn't, you didn't. And, and this is the problem with then having a, you know, a cast on independent judiciary. It was then extremely difficult to do anything about that. So it is, you know, education is, is key and, and just to pick up on, on, on Peter's um, metaphor about converting to Judaism, there is a thing which you hear a lot in Ukraine, that it, it, it took the Jews 40 years in the wilderness to emerge and create their own state. And so it's, a generation has to pass before, before, you can, before these things come about, which is quite a hard thing to tell. Um, I think the 40 years is a metaphor, though. I don't think it was... I think it was actually... <laughs> yeah, no. Tell me the Bible isn't literally... No, no, no. <laughs> um, Another couple of questions or comments? Right on there. Um, hi, uh, my name is Julia Connell. I'm the Irish uh, uh, representative on the uh, COAS committee over in Russia and the Ukrainian government. Um, I just had a question to Oliver about the, the new Ukrainian government and the reform uh, package part of the new government plan that has received kind of widespread, very positive response from the IMF and World Bank. Um, what do you think of it? Uh, and then also, Within that, uh, just another question about the new government. 
your view or perhaps Peter's view of, of the three uh, international members of the Ukrainian cabinet, whether this cross fertilization is a positive thing, a, a good marketing strategy, or a, I see the, the new Minister for Finance is being investigated for corruption in the States, so I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing, but I'd welcome your views. Um. We were, we were talking about this on the train, actually, about how you could create two different case studies between Georgia and Ukraine, one which did an enormous amount to fight corruption, what happened, and one which has effectively done nothing. Um, that is actually a bit harsh. Ukraine has taken a few steps. They have reversed some of the legislative damage that was done during the Yanukovych years, and now with this new package they are taking a few steps, but it is, these are baby steps. I mean, they have now selected the man, it's a very good man, Lefatry Barov, good guy, but they have selected the man who will chair the committee which will select the person who will be head of the new anti-corruption agency. You know, so, I mean, that's a step, don't get me wrong, um, but it's a very long way from being anything like arresting someone and putting them in jail. So, I mean, it's, the problem is that, that all these things are necessary and need to be done and there needs to be consensus building and all that, but, but the problem is that, that among ordinary Ukrainians, they're just looking and nothing's being done. Um, and the patience is not endless. And, you know, and the problem is, and you do hear this a lot from people who took part in the revolution, um, and people who, who you know, were organising the protest, people who, who were among the NGOs that supported the protest, just say, you know, you, I kept here in February, but that was in November, that there will be another revolution, and this time it's going to be really nasty. Um, because, you know, the, the, everything is too slow. Re really, you know, this is... I, 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 the rumours, you hear endless rumours that the guys who were close to Yanukovych have made peace with the Prime Minister and are now back in, in Kiev. You know, doing the same old deals. You know, you know the, the, the guys who ran all the corrupt tenders in the health ministry, they're all back in the health ministry running the same tenders. So the only people who know how to navigate the paperwork because the system has not been changed. So they haven't simplified the system. So the only people who know the, the, the system are the people who make money out of the system. So, you know, that is... You know, Yes, there are positive steps, but, but they are tiny and very far between. Yeah. With regard to the three foreigners, I, I understand why they did that. Um, I think that that's probably a good idea. Um, it's, it's, however, it's, it's both good and bad sides. The fact that they don't have local connections is good because it means they're not corrupt. But the problem is if you don't have local connections, it makes it very hard to get anything done. And it's worth, just as a cautionary tale, talking about the, the EU BAM mission in, um, in uh, Odessa, which was a border monitoring mission to try and crack down on, on Transnistria and the smuggling going in there, particularly from Odessa. Um, you know, foreigners went in there, it was supposed to be great, it was going to sort it out. But, you know, to be fair, the foreigners who went to run the mission, an EU border monitoring mission in Odessa, I don't think they were really necessarily, the, you know, the highest profile candidates, and essentially it's done nothing. Um, so it, it is that this can, again, have an unintended consequence of a knock-on effect of discrediting the West. It's like we've got an American as a finance minister and nothing's been done. Therefore, the Americans are all, you know, on the take as well. So, no, it, it's, you know, there are things being done. I'm, I'm, it's wrong to say nothing's yeah. being done, but it may as well be nothing. No, <laughs> so I, no I, I'm going to be more positive. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in fairly close touch with somebody who's a, who's very involved in the, in the, um, the creation of a new economic plan, and he's far more positive than you are. I mean, there's a, there, there are very, you know, this is really, so my experience in Kiev is, you know, going, going there after the, after, after the Maidan was for the first time meeting people who were committed to economic and structural reform and using the same kind of language that you heard in Poland or in Central Europe in the 1990s. And I'd, I'd never heard that before in Kiev. And there's a, there's a sort of, there's a generation of Ukrainians who both understand how the economy should work and who are really committed to um, uh, you know that the you know the fight against corruption is slightly different from the fight for macroeconomic stability. But the ones who are committed to macroeconomic stability are very well educated. They understand what needs to be done, and in theory could could, could do it. So I don't think it's it's not, it's not as if the IMF money is being tossed on fire. That that's what I would argue. Anyway, so let, Peter wanted to answer no, what, his part of the question. No, I think Oliver covered that actually. I don't really have much to ask. You don't have anything more to say than all that? About, uh, no, I think, no, okay. not for a moment. <laughs> there was one. So, uh, you, you want to follow up on that? There's, there's another question. So. Yeah, no, I would like to bring one clarification on the three ministers. They're not as foreign. Uh, oh, oh, no, no, I know the Ukrainian now. Sorry. Yes, sorry. No, sorry. Yes, uh, first, uh, first lady is uh, Yareska. She, was, she lived in Ukraine yeah. since 90s. Okay. And she is uh, of Ukrainian uh, descent. So like, if you would ask uh, politicians or business people, they even don't know that she's, uh, she had a US citizen. Second one Looks is like the Lithuanian. He also lived in Ukraine for, te for 10 years. And he has built a successful um, 
business, uh, Western energy, etc. So, I mean, this at least these two cases are really well connected to yeah. Ukraine. Uh, yeah. I mean, and there, there have been some presidents of Baltic countries who have U.S. passports, so it's it's not totally unheard of. Oh, why don't you say? Thank you very much. I'm uh, Martin Fleischer, East West Institute. I have uh, two questions. Maybe the first one is simple and stupid. The second one, I hope, is not. My first question is: to How far the, the 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 scope of corruption has at least partly simply to do with insufficient pay and insufficient social security for the public service. I've often been asked, I mean, I'm German, I've often been asked why you have so little corruption in Germany. Uh, I say uh, German civil servants, judges, policemen, they are certainly not better human beings, but they know if there is only a small case of corruption, they will use their retirement pension and everything. The second question uh, I have is what I would call uh, the victim effect. Now, with, with the, the armed conflict in Eastern uh, Ukraine, call it a Russian invasion, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's very difficult for the EU to, to, to press the Ukrainian government for, for serious reforms. And being, being so, so to speak, the victim of the, the aggression, they seem to be above any, any serious criticism. Is there any advice how the EU can deal with this, what I call victim effect when pressing Ukraine for reforms? You want to take on this? Yeah. I, I, I think with, with regard to your first question, it's undoubtedly one of the reasons why um, people take bribes is because they're not paid enough money. Um, I've recently spent a lot of time um, sort of embedding myself in, in a particular hospital, in quite a large hospital, the main cancer hospital in Kiev, um, where a consultant anaesthetist with 23 years' experience is being paid uh, almost 300 euros a month. Um, this it, it means it's laughable. You can't live on that. Um, and the idea that he wouldn't take bribes you know, it just doesn't occur to him. He couldn't survive if he didn't. Mm. But the problem is that, that, that this is a, there is a sort of a side effect on this problem, which is that there is enough money in the hospital. The money is being stolen at the top. It is being stolen out of the procurement budget by massive overpaying of the, for equipment and for drugs. That money is then being split between the managers and the, um, and the, the, the businessmen. Um, so that money is gone. And he knows the money exists because he can see what's being spent, but he knows he's, none of it's coming to him. And he's also having to take bribes from patients, not only to supplement his own salary, but to maintain the equipments that he needs to keep his patients alive. It's incredibly dis essentially um, demoralizing for him. He, he's looking at, at, at a situation when he is being forced to effectively steal money from his patients to keep them alive, while he can see his own manager making money. So, so you're right. I mean, part of the reason is people being paid a very small amount, but, but there is the money. The money exists. It's not. It's um. It, it's being stolen before it gets to him. Um, Do you, we, you want to take yeah. the second part of the question? Um, no, no. I think I think that there, there think, could have been. I think with, 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 with regard to the yeah. second one, with the war and pushing, being hard to make reforms when they're under attack, it's true. And I think we have to recognise that's one of the reasons Putin's doing it. Um, uh, if it is to distract everyone, if if um, is it like a. Um, you know, these, these funfair tricks when, when if someone is doing something amazing with their right hand, a magician, Sorry? If, some, if a magician is doing something with his right hand, something dramatic, you should always look at what they're doing with their left hand. Um, Putin is deliberately um, creating a situation there to prevent the government from getting a ha any kind of handle on it. And, and so I think it's important to look at this as a war with two fronts. There is a, a, a domestic front against corruption and there is a, a foreign front against corruption. And, and, that's the way. Yeah, I mean, pe people often ask, you know, what is Putin's goal in Ukraine? You know, why is he fighting this war? You know, how long will he go? I mean, I think it's become fairly obvious over the last few months that the goal is destabilization. You know, long term, destabilize, disrupt, maybe, maybe through this war in the East, maybe through there have been a few acts of terrorism in other parts of the country recently, maybe through economic destabilization. The idea is to undermine um, continually. And I mean, uh, even before the war began, um, before the invasion of eastern Ukraine, um, you know, Ukrainian reformers in Kiev were already talking about exactly the point you're making. You know, from the from the NGOs' point of view, there's a dilemma. You know, we see that our government is going to be fighting a war. If there's a war, how do we put pressure on them to, to do things we want them to do? We need to. We should be gathering behind them to fight the war. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's a it's a. I don't think it's a solvable dilemma. I mean, either for the EU or for Ukrainians who want real changes. And as as Oliver said, that's why it's happening is to is to is to create this dilemma for people. Do you want to say something? And then we'll take one more question. I think we want to end it. But, the, 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 but there's a flip side to that as well. So so in Georgia, part of the reason why the anti-corruption drive was so um, given such a strong narrative is that they. they, they redefine corruption not as an economic problem but as a security problem. So they wanted to clean up the uh, 
um, sort of the interior ministry because it was uh, you know, full of Russian spies. Um, so the one thing they've reformed quite well in Ukraine, from what I understand, is the intelligence services. So the SBU, like three quarters of the SBU, were just sacked uh, because it was full of, I mean, they couldn't function anymore, it was full of spies. Um, so one of the ways Putin will look to destabilize Ukraine is through corruption. So once corruption becomes a security agenda, then it seems to me to have a very strong stimulus for reforms. Um, yes, a new uh, way Poroshenko just, to turn it around. Yeah, we're fighting corruption in order to fight. Listen, like, Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk, and Novakov are just building up various power blocks within uh, within the bureaucracies. They're not really. I don't know to what extent they're really even thinking about it. They're still thinking about ter- wars between each other as much as the war with Ukraine, uh, with with Russia. Sorry. No, but yeah. So there is certainly space for a Russian narrative. That would, I mean, sorry, a Ukrainian narrative that says yeah. we're fighting. You know, we're fighting, as, as Oliver just put it, we're fighting a war on two fronts. But like, so Alan Sugar, you're Russian, you're a Russian spy, you're fired. <laughs> That'd be terrible. But, um, uh, but you know, it can, conflict can be used as a very strong stimulus to fight corruption. Yeah. Um, one, one more comment or question, and then we'll, we'll break up this. Maybe a positive comment uh, as from Ukrainian civil society part. I have to disagree with you, Oliver, that revolution is failing. Uh, because if I agree with you, I might as well go home and close the door and burn my Ukrainian flag. <laughs> uh, I also disagree that Orange Revolution failed because at that time we didn't have an aim to rebuild the structure. So our aim was to gain our vote, go back home and just come back to our business. And uh, now the civil society understood they have to be, um, they have to take part in it. And I, I, I think uh, we did manage a lot. We did manage to put civil society into uh, the parliament. And what are they doing is amazing how they fight, you know, how they uh, fought against uh, corrupt people to head the uh, committees. And now they start campaigning against uh, Yaros. How they use Facebook as a transparency tool. It's just incredible. They put all the documents on Facebook and there was a discussion. So the secret between us is communication. We always talk about it. that. EU don't, doesn't communicate directly to Ukraine, and Russia fills uh, in this gap. So, well, you know, I actually had a, we have to talk. I had a very long, drunken evening in Kiev quite recently when we concluded at about four, four in the morning that there's no such thing as a failed revolution. That even if a revolution that does not achieve its goals raises awareness and creates grounds for a future successful revolution. So you're right. There are there has been there have been there has been improvements, but maybe not the improvements that happened. It's good to criticize, but if we often talk about the baby, it might grow up to the teenager. You know. <laughs> that, that, that's a that's a very good bit. I I have I have a you know having also been in Ukraine, I have the I I share your feeling about it that there is enough has changed and there's enough happening and there's enough awareness that it's a different it's a different kind of place. Kiev is a different city than, than it was ten years ago. And you must help us to see the things you see and we don't. For example the Interpol list, you know, instead of saying that now, six months ago, this message had to be everywhere in the news. Guys, why are you not doing that? And people will support you. the civil society will go on Maidan again and say hello, you have to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you very much. I know you all have important jobs to go back to, um, and Brussels is a lot of traffic, so you might need to you might need to get back to them. Um, we're we're all here for a few more minutes. I think there's coffee. And- yeah, there is. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Anne, and all of you, I mean, contributors from the floor, and uh, Oliver and Tita. This was extremely exciting discussion. Uh, I deliberately was not taking floor, although I was holding myself extremely. Hardly not to, because it is a very passionate discussion where, of course, we as a government also have a, a very, very specific experience and we're doing a lot of work in those countries and we see those problems quite well from the very, very grassroots level uh, position and we're trying also to bring this reflection more to the Brussels debates uh, in order to inform uh, EU policies as well, because I still believe that something can be done from Brussels as well. Although it's true, and, and I am strongly convinced about this, and many people that, uh, that anything uh, substantive and decisive can be only done within the country. So whatever association agreement, whatever uh, financial instruments, they are important, they are helpful, but they are not decisive. Decisive is what the people will do with their own countries. That's for sure. Thank you again, uh, Anna, for uh, coming. Thank you, Peter and Oliver, for joining us. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, because of the delay of the, of the, the fastest train, uh, we, uh, we switched uh, the order, so the lunch was before the debate. Uh, but I don't know whether some coffee is there, yeah? So there is still uh, some refreshments and coffee.
out there, and we can use this time for a private talk uh, to follow up and uh, to get uh, to get uh, closer to our wonderful guest here. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank, Thank you. you very much.